I've been using SideFX's procedural dependency graph for the last few months now on the last two shows and I figured I'd put together a little tutorial to show some things to consider if you're looking at using it or you're considering uh, implementation into your pipeline. So in this tutorial, it's really gonna be just going over the, some of the basics, but also some things to consider uh, with this new style of how we can wedge data and how to run things in parallel and maintain per frame dependency. So I hope this simple example helps you out uh, in terms of being able to see the benefit that TOPS can give you if you start to implement it into your pipeline. Um, there's no other system that I've seen that's able to leverage um, per frame dependency through a data workflow that is as well designed as this. I, I know that there's still issues and that side effects are working on them. I really appreciate how responsive side effects have been um, on dealing with those. Uh, but the reality is that this tool is able to offer me uh, a highly efficient system that it would have taken me months to build if I was to try and do this um, by myself. I've never seen a, a system that's able to do these types of dependency systems, uh, especially on a local machine. Any of the systems that I've ever seen with good per frame dependent systems were, were never that fast in terms of having no latency and being able to operate on a local machine in tandem with the farm. And I feel that this is really what side effects are starting to carve out a, a unique space in is that the idea of hybridizing your local compute power versus your farm power and even what happens in the cloud. So I've already got workflows working where I'm able to drop in per frame dependency that runs on the cloud at any stage that I want. So I'm able to have per frame upload as I'm simulating um, and or I can just run the whole sim on the other side if I want, and I can run per frame dependencies at any stage that I like. So TOPS is really giving us uh, a, a good foundation for how we're going to be able to hybridize um, compute in different locations uh, much more easily. So I think it's really exciting what we're gonna be able to do with that um, when it's fully established. But here you can just see a taste for what's possible on a local workstation. If you find this video helpful and you want to support my work or you want to support my Open Firehawk cloud visual effects rendering project, uh, please support me on Patreon. Some of the custom scripts that you see me using in this are available on the Firehawk VFX GitHub repository. They're not necessary uh, to being able to achieve the same type of workflows as are featured in this video, but they just, they just help streamline a few things like being able to quickly update your versioning and parameter templates like how you choose to write output to disk. So like I said, all of that's completely optional. You don't need to use it at all um, to be able to achieve similar workflows to what I'm showing in this video. Um, but that stuff is there if you want to use it. So in this simple uh, fracturing and destruction workflow, I, it's just a simple SOP example, but I wanted to at least cover the various types of wedging that you're going to encounter and what to consider in terms of uh, implementation and how the new wedging system changes things. So here the basic idea was what if we want to wedge, uh, say, multiple objects and we might put them through a fracturing workflow and out the other side, we might also, other than just wedging the objects, we might also have wedged variations of how those objects are being fractured. So the thing to consider here is wedging things like element names and then wedging variations uh, some other level in. And there's no restriction here to what you might choose to do. This could even be a multi-dimensional parameter. You could have multiple uh, wedge variables in at this stage, but I just wanted to cover the two differences here. So when we're wedging multiple elements, it's often useful to split them to different ROP outputs. Um, and that way, whatever you're doing to control your versions, in my case, I have a right click parameter that allows me to set up this versioning. Um, so I have a menu in my open source repository that allows me to propagate these uh, template attributes. And there's really nothing tricky going on here. Uh, I'm just building my file name out of these template attributes. So 
you're welcome to do whatever you like here. Um, but the main thing that happens when I click on update is it sets that version to the current hip file version. So when we're wedging elements, it's useful to split them to different ROPs in order to track versioning. And it's possible to get more advanced and to limit having to do that. But for the basics, I just, I think that it's really useful to consider that as a workflow. So being able to wedge out to multiple ROPs uh, is useful if you want to track independent versions. Um, but then beyond that, if you start wedging uh, parameter variations, like maybe you start fracturing, uh, you might have different fracture variations or you might be testing um, different parameters within your simulation. Uh, in, in those instances, I tend to use this dot um, W and then the wedge number um, in order to identify those different elements. So I actually have two different dimensions of wedging uh, occurring at the same time. So I, I just wanted to cover that, you know, initially uh, in terms of how we think about our attributes and how we think about our, um, our element names. So in this case, uh, we might have one element name that's de determined by op digits. So when we use op digits, we're able to pull that number from the ROP itself. Uh, but we also have, I can also reference that number in tops using at element, which is what I've created here. So in tops, the primary parameter I'm using to wedge those different elements is specified by this element attribute. So I just use the element to point at the different ROPs, either when I'm actually submitting it or for the reader. So the reader is going to look at these different ROPs based on that attribute. So one significant change that it's really important to try and embrace is the use of these new at style attributes. So this attribute in the first wedge, which wedges the three different objects, uh, can be referenced as at element. And although it is possible to ex export that to the environment, uh, you're really asking for trouble if you start using dollar element in your output paths. So uh, at this point, I feel like it's just, it's much better if you can try to stick to using the at attribute workflow, um, try to ditch environment variables um, because it just seems that the issues with them, they, they, they still exist. It's possible for environment variables to not get set correctly. And the at style attributes are much better at being evaluated in parallel. So for example, you know, I might be able, I might choose to create some attribute, uh, referencing at element, and it can be evaluated in parallel for multiple work items. Whereas if you're using an environment variable, you'd have to create some sort of custom string replacement workflow in order to achieve that. Um, so the, the advantages of the new at attribute workflow are, are really important to, to utilize. And if you find that it's not working for you, that there's something that's clunky going on, um, send side effects an example because I found that they've been very responsive in being able to improve this workflow. Um, it wasn't too long ago that if you selected a work item here and if you click somewhere else, there would be no attributes that were active. But now at least if we have an attribute selected uh, through a work item, these attributes are now active for the network. So at wedge num and at element, those are the active attributes um, currently if I go back into SOPS. So we can see that um, my reader, which is using those at attributes to pick up the correct ROP to read from, is actually uh, evaluating that parameter, um, that at, yeah, that parameter correctly and the attribute uh, that is telling it to pick up the correct ROP. So, I am trying to move over aggressively towards the new attribute at attribute workflow. There's still a few things that we have RFEs for uh, with side effects. Um, for example, if I close and reopen a hip file right now, those at attributes will have an invalid value. They, they'll just be blank. So you actually, uh, on file load, you, you do have to select a generate and select a work item in order to um, generate a value on uh, once you start navigating your your network. Uh, so you just have to do that at least once once you open a hip file, but otherwise um, 
you will have a valid value throughout the Houdini session. To give you an overview of what you're familiar with in SOPS, we've got our three different objects referenced uh, by at element. And we have our wedge variations where we're going to wedge um, fracture variations that will be using the at style wedge num in our, in our string that's written out to disk. So in my case, I'm just using that uh, attribute right there. So we're going to write out static data here, which is the fractured object. And we're going to write out our simulation data here, which is just the transform. So it's just points. And then we, when we actually generate a flipbook, uh, we're going to uh, apply the transforms to the static object. So this is also using the new um, RBD material-based workflow, um, which allows us to pretty quickly um, put together transforms without having to write heavy data out to disk and keep static data and transform it by the, um, by the animation data. So then to look at the top net, how I'm actually going to build a top net that handles this with per frame dependencies all the way through. We've got our first wedge dimension, which is element. So if we have three wedges with a range of zero to two, then we're going to have a zero, a one, and a two. And when that plugs into the next wedge, which has four uh, wedge values, this will generate four wedge values for every single work item that comes in here. And so that means for each at element zero, we're going to get four wedges that are going to come out with wedge zero, wedge one, wedge two, wedge three. And in this case, I'm pushing a value instead of pulling it. So here, we're pulling at element when we use at element. In this case, we're actually pushing a value out to a target parameter. And we're playing with the scatter um, seed and the noise offset on the fracture object. Um, oh, that's another bug there, actually. It's not, even though I'm pointing at a, a variable, it's not actually diving in on the target. So I'll probably open up another RFE for that. Um, so that's actually pointed at a variable, uh, sorry, an, an at, um, a parameter to uh, vary uh, these attributes here. So we get uh, different fracture variations. So the only other thing that I've done here, and you know, I don't really have to do this, but I am using wedge num downstream. So you can see here when you generate a wedge, you're gonna get this wedge index and a wedge num. And because I'm using wedge num as my second dimension, um, I, I tend to just clean it out here. I don't, I don't want wedge num to be referenced by this data uh, because if I didn't do that, and let's say I didn't have any wedges here, and I was only writing out um, these three wedges, then um, wedge num, which is referenced in my file output, um, that dot w and then the number would be incremented for each wedge as well. And I don't need to do that because I'm only using the element to um, create a unique file path. Uh, so I'm just doing that for cleanliness to make sure that wedge num stays as zero uh, for all of the elements uh, so that I don't end up writing out each element um, with, um, with multiple indexes uh, which is totally unnecessary. So in my case, it's the second dimension, it's the second stage of wedging that I care about the wedge num value, and that's gonna just start looping. So you can see we get to three here, and then the next one will go back to zero. Now, we've got a total of 12 different variations here, and then in order to reference each element individually and to only version up each one where required, I filter by the element. So in this case, we're using op digits, which references the name here of zero to filter out just the, um, just the wedges that relate to the first object, the second object, and the third object. And then we've got our first uh, rot fetch, which actually points at that rop output. And again, it's using op digits to point at the correct rop output 
here. Now, that was our first fracture stage, and then we have um, a, a static output. Uh, you might do modification, you might alter, say, something like your, um, you know, the noise used, or you might recut geometry at a higher resolution out of your original geometry in this stage. But this is essentially the high resolution um, static geometry that's going to be transformed. Uh, this stuff exploded. And then lastly, if we go back to the top network, uh, this is our animated sequence, which is a simulation. Uh, so this one's quite different because it's generating a frame range from a single input. So this wedge work item comes into here and because it's set to frame range instead of single, it's going to generate that frame range for every single work item uh, that comes into it. So that's a bit of a gotcha. You've got to remember that one. Uh, otherwise, if you suddenly drop in another, another node up top and you have another frame range, then you can end up with huge numbers of work items really quickly. So we're generating this frame range with a bit of pre-roll. And I wanted to also cover um, what happens when we have multiple frame ranges at different stages. So even though I'm simulating with some pre-roll here, I want to make sure that when I generate my flipbook down below that uh, I'm not generating a flipbook with the pre-roll included. Uh, so I'm going to go into that as well. So one of the goals I had in creating this tutorial is ensuring that we're able to maintain per frame dependency the whole way through, uh, which is sometimes easier said than done. And in this case, I am actually using a little bit of a hacky workaround in order to achieve it. So in order to do it here, we've got our rot fetch pointed at our simulation and we've got our static frame here. And we want each one of these wedges to have a shared dependency with the related work item here. So this work item is linked to the first uh, fracture variation uh, at wedge num zero. And this is also linked to at wedge num zero. And I want to make sure that when that work item finishes that this whole sequence and that the first frame of this sequence finishes that my flipbook is able to start um, generating frames. So to build that relationship um, at the moment what I do is I employ a little bit of a hack. We use a petition by index node which basically links the indexes and says these, these are related, these are all in one petition. Um, so unfortunately, if you were to just try and do that um, with four work items, you wouldn't be able to do it because the indexes don't line up. So you aren't able to build a relationship from this sequence, which is actually all of those guys, that sequence is actually related to that single work item. But you can see here that it's only partitioning it to frame zero. So the hack I've kind of employed here is, you know, for, for each one of these, I generate um, 126 work items, which is equal to the frame range of this guy. And that way I can actually use indexes. Um, I have tried also partition by frame, but I wasn't able to maintain per frame dependency unless I did something like this. And then I had another gotcha, um, which was, unfortunately that wasn't enough because if I were to just do that and I petition by index, unfortunately I had another issue where the frame value wasn't being passed by the first input. So see here we've got frame 990. Um, even if I don't have that ticked, merging the input attributes, I had a problem where I, uh, I wasn't getting the correct frame being passed down from the first input. So I created my own custom frame attribute to be able to filter ranges correctly. So um, in this case, uh, we created a, we, we override the frame attribute and I copy that frame attribute over by index because the number of work items is the same. So I can reliably copy these values over to here. And, oh yeah, and then when I cook that guy, 
we can see we actually have this frame attribute coming over and if I check frame 2 you can see frame 2 has a valid value so this was just a, another little hack I had to employ in order to be able to use frame correctly to be able to filter um, to filter the correct range for the flipbook. So if I generate this node now, we can see that we've got less work items. And the goal here is to make sure that, well, we have pre-roll up here. I want to get rid of that pre-roll when I'm generating the output uh, for my flipbook. So I'm going to eliminate any of the frame ranges that are um, before my, any of the frames that are before my first frame. And in this case, I have a control node that uh, defines my frame ranges. So um, this is my shot start and end, and I'm filtering out anything that's before that value. So now we've got the correct number of work items that are going to go into our actual flipbook. And the one other thing that you have to do here, uh, if I open that up, even though I filtered uh, those work items, we still have a, this range data and this range data is used with anything sequential. So because I'm generating my flipbook as one single task per wedge, I have this ticked. And because I'm doing that, it's going to use the at range attribute in order to generate that frame range. So I have to modify it because the frame 990 doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I, even though I filtered that data out, I also need to uh, generate, a, generate a range. So if we look here, you can see the range value has been updated to what I defined here as my control node range. And that is another gotcha. When you start manipulating frame ranges, you know, we've got, we've got two different frame ranges, but we still want to maintain per frame dependency is you do have to manipulate that that range data uh, for everything to work properly. So then lastly, uh, when we go into our, when we go into our rock fetch, uh, which is pointed at an OpenGL node. So I have a, a different rock net here and there is no OpenGL top yet. Uh, so I'm just referencing an OpenGL node here. And it points at the OpenGL node based on the op digits. So I've got three different OpenGL nodes with independent versions that write to the output paths uh, using the exact same um, workflow as I showed before. You know, th this versioning tab is just added when I right click on the node and I update ROP output paths. Uh, this is a custom script I built to be able to template parameters and, and generate output paths easily uh, based on uh, whatever data I like. So lastly, once we've generated our once we've generated our flipbook output, I want to create some overlays. So the overlay node's pretty handy and it's able to overlay the data uh, that we use, like our wedge number, the noise values, um, the element number. One gotcha with this is it's not able to, at the time of this video, operate with per frame dependency. Uh, it has to, I think it has to wait until all frames are ready before it can execute or you're gonna run into issues. So there's a little bit of a trade off there and I'm, I've am i also got an RFE in there for that one uh, because it would be nice to be able to have per frame dependency on this guy as well. But at least we can still, even with say heavy sim situations where we're still able to review frame output as we're simulating on all those wedges um, at least. So that's better than nothing at all, that's for sure. So when we then have all of our uh, frames written out to disk, we write out four MPEGs, uh, one for each wedge variation. So we have our sphere and our rubber toy and our, um, our pig head and the goal at the end is to have four fracture variations of each node. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increment my hip file. Uh, so I have, a, I have a little tool that I use to do that. I just increment the number of my hip file. And if I 
change the output paths to all of those ROPs, then any data that they're pointing at isn't going to exist anymore. So it's going to regenerate the data. If I just ran this again uh, right now, nothing's going to happen because even if I dirty the node, so if I, if I right click and I dirty that node, it's going to dirty everything downstream. And if I say right click on this node and I try to cook it, because all of that data exists on disk, it's not going to uh, cook that data. So in order to do that, in order to force a cook, you have to either delete the, the data from disk up here. So if I delete data up here from disk and it has to reevaluate, everything else downstream should reevaluate. Uh, but the other option you have is to point it at a path that doesn't exist yet. So in my case, if I were to increment the version on the outputs, so I'll show you the slow way obviously is you know, selecting the nodes and making sure the versions are pointed to the same version of my hip part of my hip name. Okay. Then it's going to um, find that there's no data there and all of the work items are going to cook. Uh, in my case, I actually have a, a right click menu for this. So when I right click on a selection of nodes, uh, if I right click using my, my tool, all this tool does is it's just going to dive in on all of the ROP outputs that we're pointed at and it's just going to set that version to be the same as my current hip file. So I'm now guaranteed that none of these have valid paths. They're all going to be non-existent paths. But the last thing I do have to do is I have to dirty the work item because you see that if I try to cook again, uh, even though we're pointed, pointed at an invalid path, uh, TOPS isn't aware yet that the path is invalid because the work items are cooked. Now, I'm not sure if that's something that could perhaps be improved upon in the future. I think that maybe as soon as you see that a, a path is invalid, um, that perhaps these nodes should be, or the work items should be dirtied. Um, but that's what, that's what the workflow is right now. So currently all our nodes are pointed at non-existent paths. So I'm going to dirty the top node and now we're going to cook everything downstream. Now we may see one issue later with the OpenGL node. Uh, it's not great on Linux. It sometimes has issues, but, um, usually if I just cook again, it goes away. So. Here we can see our 12 fracture variations all running out in parallel. You can probably hear my machine spinning up. It sounds like a plane taking off. Um, so as these start to finish, we're going to have our simulations begin and we're going to have our static data, our static fracture, high res fracture data get written out. And now we've got all our per, per frame dependencies running. And you can see now we've got our um, our OpenGL outputs running as soon as possible. So perhaps this isn't like the best demonstration because this sim is a really, really fast one. So um, you're not able to see exactly that it is per frame dependent, um, but it is. I've, I've tested it on heavier workflows and I've been using this type of system in, in very heavy shots. Uh, so I, I know that this workflow does work when it comes to maintaining per frame dependency. So you can see we're actually running um, 12, what have we got, two, four, four, about eight flipbooks right now simultaneously. Uh, I have a 1080 Ti. Um, it's, a, it's a light scene, but I, I often uh, find that I am able to review about seven different simulations uh, at a time. Um, and I'm able to write them all out to disk per frame dependently. Uh, and it really alleviates my need for any external farm uh, quite a lot. So, you know, being able to leverage this type of workflow can mean if you've got a beefy machine, it means that FX TDs are, if they're able to work efficiently, they're able to be way less dependent on a farm than ever before. Because as you can see, the local scheduler is blazing fast. Uh, if you were using a standard scheduler uh, in place of this, it probably wouldn't be so responsive. There'd be much more latency in terms of network communication. Um, so that is another really important key point. If you're going to leverage tops in your own pipeline, 
It's really important to consider compatibility with the local scheduler as well as any custom scheduler or deadline scheduler that you may be using uh, because being able to use the local scheduler wherever possible allows you to just eliminate latency and get output really quickly. So here we've got our 12 videos that are coming out the back and if I, sorry, if I middle click on the node um, or if I scroll over the node and press the I, I'm able to see the output. So if I click here and I click on one of these, just let me, so here we've got, um, if, we, if we look here, we've got our three different elements and we've got our versioning 92 and then I've got my four different variations for each element. So here we can see uh, wedge 0, element 2 and we can see the noise offset value. Here it's wedge, wedge 1, wedge 2 and wedge 3. And then if I look at Fracture Sim 1, I can review version 92. And we're looking at the rubber toy here, I think. So that's wedge 0, wedge 1, wedge 2, and wedge 3. And then if I look at Sim 0, let's check those wedges. So we've got our sphere. We've got three, uh, four different variations of the fracture on the sphere. And there they all are. So I hope this really helps uh, you guys out. I feel like whether or not you're a beginner to TOPS or you're considering implementing this into your pipeline, there's gonna be some benefit here because it's really important to consider the, uh, the multiple use cases of uh, wedging element names versus um, wedging, say, a parameter space. And then also considering how to maintain per frame dependency the whole way through the pipe um, by ensuring that the right relationships exist. And you know, for better or worse, I am employing some hacks here to achieve that. But I do have an RFE with this, with this problem with side effects and I'm sure they're gonna be able to get a fix out there to make it easier for other people. Um, I'm sure this tutorial will become dated really quickly because I find that uh, side effects are really responsive in being able to deal with um, usage problems or if there's like a problem set that seems, you know, like it should be solved. Um, they're, they're very responsive in terms of being able to give me example files back or being able to suggest the right workflow. And in the case that it doesn't, sometimes they've had fixes um, really rapidly in their next daily build. So um, the, the quicker that we get on this tool and that we, you know, start to leverage it and provide our needs for what we need to see it do in our pipe, um, then the quicker we're gonna be in a position where we are able to handle really heavy workflows with it. If you'd like to support me to produce more tutorials like this, you can contribute to my Patreon page. Those contributions also go to my Open Firehawk cloud rendering project. My intention in seeing that project succeed is to potentially enable a totally different economy when it comes to utilizing cloud-based resources. One where we may be able to switch between cloud providers on demand based on the cost of their resources and one that puts you in direct control over how your pipeline is managed in the cloud. I feel like it's such a huge benefit for artists to be able to work in this way where there aren't too many things, there aren't too many situations uh, that I've been in that I wouldn't be able to leverage a system like this to get rapid iterative um, previews on data during the day and then run the heavy stuff on the farm during the night. Um, most, of the, most of the heaviest systems that I've ever dealt with would have been able to um, be leveraged better by having some um, proxy preview versions that could run in this way. And having that, that rapid feedback uh, really gives you the visibility on the, the performance that you need to be able to keep a system performing highly. Being able to just improve efficiency all around and being able to work independently of, of a farm, provided you've got a heavy workstation, is super useful. And it may take some studios some time to realize this. It's not until they start implementing it that they're gonna recognize this. It's gonna make way more sense for TDs to have you know, really chunky machines to be able to operate unhindered um, by farm workloads.
um, because it's possible to not be limited by uh, crunch time, at least in the same way. There's still going to be some situations, you know, I still need a farm when it comes to high-end rendering. Um, but even rendering previews, I was doing on heavy 100 million particle flip sims and I was rendering uh, mantra frames at low quality and I was able to still do effective previews on a local machine that way.